Lesson 8 for February 13 to 19, Comfort My People, read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, February 13. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for your amazing book, the Bible, and we thank you for one of the books in there, the book of Isaiah that we're studying this quarter. And it presents us with so many conundrums, so many interesting things that also tell us about your love, your grace, your power, your strength, and that you are the one for us to worship. We thank you that we have this study today, but we also thank you that each of us, wherever we are in the world, whether we're uh, in Europe, whether we're in the Caribbean, whether we're in Africa, whether we're in Australia, whether we're, whether we're in one of the islands of the sea, that we can not only pray to you, but put our trust in you. We pray that right today you'll be with each one who is listening and their families. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 9. Get up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Let's read that again. Isaiah 40 and verse 9. Get up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. World War II ended in 1945, while a Japanese soldier named Shochi Yokoi was hiding out in the jungle on the island of Guam. Leaflets dropped from U.S. planes proclaimed peace, but Yokoi thought it a trick. A loyal, patriotic soldier of the emperor, he had vowed never to surrender. Because he had no contact with civilization, he lived on what he could find in the jungle, a sparse, hard existence indeed. And then the author of our lessons, Roy Gain, writes in his book, Alter Call, page 304, In 1972, 27 years after the end of World War II, hunters came across Yokoi while he was fishing, and he only then learned that the message of peace had been true. While the rest of his people had been enjoying peace for decades, Yokoi had been enduring decades of privation and stress. End of quote. Many centuries earlier, through the prophet Isaiah, God announced that the time of his people's stress and suffering was really over in Isaiah 40 verses 1 and 2. Comfort, O oh, comfort my people, says the Lord. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Let's take a look at what that means. Sunday, February 14, Comfort for the Future. Our text for today is Isaiah 40, verses 1 and 2. Question, in Isaiah 40, 1 and 2, God comforts his people. Their time of punishment has finally ended. What punishment is that? Isaiah 40, beginning at verse 1. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. There are many answers to this question. There was the punishment administered by Assyria, the rod of God's anger, we read about that in Isaiah chapter 10, from which God delivered Judah by destroying Sennacherib's army in 701 BC. We read about that in Isaiah 37. 
There was the punishment administered by Babylon, which would carry away goods and people from Judah because Hezekiah had displayed his wealth to the messengers from Merodach Baladan. We read about that in Isaiah 39. And there was the punishment administered by one of the other nations against which Isaiah wrote messages in Isaiah 14 right through to 23. Meanwhile, though Assyria and Assyrians are mentioned 43 times from Isaiah 7:17 7, to chapter 38, verse 6, this nation appears only once in the rest of Isaiah, where Isaiah 52, verse 4, refers to past oppression by Egypt and then by the Assyrian. In the latter part of Isaiah, deliverance from exile in Babylon is mentioned in Isaiah 43.14, Isaiah 47.1, Isaiah 48.14 and 20, and it is Cyrus the Persian who conquered Babylon in 539 who is to free the exiles of Judah. We read about that in Isaiah 44 and verse 28. Who said to Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, You shall be built, and to the temple your foundation shall be laid? And Isaiah 45, 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him, to loose the armour of kings, to open before him the double doors, so that the gates will not be shut. And chapter 45, verse 13, I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city, and let my exiles go free, not for price nor reward, says the Lord of hosts. Isaiah chapter 1 to chapter 39 emphasizes events leading up to deliverance from the Assyrians in 701 BC. But at the beginning of chapter 40, the book leaps ahead a century and a half to the end of Babylon in 539 BC, and the return of the Jews shortly thereafter. Question. Is the theme of return from Babylon linked with anything earlier in Isaiah? If so, what? Isaiah 39 serves as a transition to the following chapters by predicting a Babylonian captivity, at least for some of Hezekiah's descendants, as we read in Isaiah 39, 6 and 7. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord." And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Furthermore, the oracles of Isaiah 13, 14 and 21 predict the fall of Babylon and the liberty this would bring to God's people, as we read in Isaiah 14 verses 1 to 4. But the Lord will have compassion on Jacob and will again choose Israel and will set them in their own land. When the Lord has given you rest from your pain and turmoil and the hard service with which you were made to serve, you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. Notice the close connection with Isaiah 40, verses 1 and 2, where God promises his people there is an end to their suffering. And so, to finish today, what do Bible promises about the end of suffering mean to you now, amid your present suffering? What good would your faith be without those promises? Why, then, is it so important to cling to them no matter what. Monday, February 15. Presence, Word and Roadwork. Question. How do God's people receive comfort? Isaiah 40, verses 1 to 8. 
Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says our God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice said, Cry out, and he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. An unnamed herald announces that God is coming to reveal his glory in verses 3 to 5. Another voice proclaims that although humans are transient like foliage, the word of our God will stand forever. After the exile, God's people gained back what they had received at Mount Sinai and then rejected all throughout their apostasy for which they were punished. God's presence and his word. These are the basic ingredients of God's covenant with Israel, which were enshrined at his sanctuary in their midst, in Exodus chapter 28, verses 8, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, and verse 16, and you shall put into the ark the testimony which I will give you. Because they had violated his word, God had abandoned his people, as we read in uh, Ezekiel chapter 9 through to chapter 11. But he is coming back. His presence and his eternally dependable word bring comfort, deliverance and hope. Question. What preparation is necessary for the Lord's coming? Isaiah chapter 40 verses 3 to five. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. It is not fitting for a king to be jolted by a rough road, so his coming is preceded by road work. The more so for the king of kings. This coming, apparently from the east, where he has been in exile with his people as a sanctuary to them, Ezekiel 11 verse 16, Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, although I have cast them far off among the Gentiles, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet I shall be a little sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone, would require major rearrangement of the terrain. Construction of a literal level superhighway through the rugged hills east of Jerusalem would be daunting, even with dynamite and bulldozers. God is the only one who can do the work. It is he who turns the rough places into level ground, as we read in Isaiah 42, verse 16. But he doesn't need a literal road for transportation because he has an airborne chariot of cherubim, as described in Ezekiel chapters 1, 9, 10 and 11. The New Testament explicitly applies Isaiah's prophecy to the spiritual roadwork accomplished through the preaching of John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 3. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. His message was, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near, in verse 2. And the baptism that he performed was 
of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as you read in Mark 1 verse 4. So, the roadwork was repentance, willingness to turn away from sin, in order to receive the comfort of God's forgiveness and presence. Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 31 to 34 proclaimed the same spiritual message in plenty of time for the exiles of Judah to understand the spiritual nature of roadwork for God. In this passage, the Lord promises those who are willing a fresh start, a new covenant in which he puts his law in their hearts and pledges to be their God. They know him and his character because he has forgiven them. And Jeremiah 31, beginning at verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbour, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. So to finish the day, read carefully Isaiah 40, verses 6 to 8. What hope can you, who fade away as does the grass, derive from what these verses say? In what should they warn us against putting our trust? Isaiah 40, beginning at verse 6. The voice said, Cry out. And he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Tuesday, February 16, The Birth of Evangelism Question, what kind of event is described in Isaiah 40, verses 9 to 11? O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd, he will gather the lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those who are with young. Later in Isaiah, there appears a male herald of good news for Jerusalem. We read about this in Isaiah 41, verse 27. The first time I said to Zion, Look, there they are, and I will give to Jerusalem one who brings good tidings. And Isaiah 52, verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. But in Isaiah 40, Verse 9, the herald to proclaim, Here is your God, from a mountain, is female, a fact brought out in the Hebrew. In Psalm 68, David praises God because he gives the desolate a home to live in. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity. In verse 6, Though here these words apply to the exodus from Egyptian bondage, Isaiah uses the same ideas with reference to the proclamation of a second exodus, the return from Babylonian captivity. 
Meanwhile, the New Testament applies Isaiah 43-5 to to John the Baptist, who prepared the way for Christ, the eternal Word who became the Lord's presence in flesh among his people, as we read in John 1 verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Even earlier than John, others spoke about the good news of his coming. Among the first of these were the elderly Simeon and Anna, who met baby Jesus when he was dedicated at the temple. We read about this in Luke chapter 2, verses 25 to 38. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marvelled at these things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them, and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher, she was of a great age, and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about eighty-four years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instance, she gave thanks to the Lord, and spoke of him to all who looked for redemption in Jerusalem." Like Isaiah's heralds, they were male and female. Simeon was looking forward to the consolation or comfort of Israel in the form of the Messiah, and uh, that was quoted just then in Luke 2, verses 25 and 26. In light of Isaiah's prophecy, it does not appear coincidental that Anna, a prophetess, was the very first to announce publicly at the Temple Mountain to the people of Jerusalem, that the Lord had come. At that moment she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem, Luke 2.38. This was the birth of Christian evangelism as we know it, proclamation of the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ has come to bring salvation. Later, Christ entrusted to another woman, Mary Magdalene, the first tidings of his triumphant resurrection, as you read in John 20, verses 17 and 18, which ensured that his gospel commission to planet Earth was accomplished. John 20, verse 17, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascended to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things to her. Flesh is like grass, but the divine word who became flesh is eternal, as we read in Isaiah 40, verses 6 to 8. The voice said, Cry out, and he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. And so to finish the day, 
Look at Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 11. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. What kind of imagery is presented here? Write out for yourself a paragraph on how you, personally, have experienced shepherding by the Lord. Why is it good to recount in your mind the way the Lord has led you? Wednesday, February 17. Merciful Creator. And our first question is, how does Isaiah 40 develop the themes of God's mercy and power? Throughout this chapter, God's mercy and power are interwoven, as we'll see below, and even blended together, because they are both necessary in order for God to save his people. He wants to save them, because he is merciful. He is able to save them because he is powerful. And we'll look at these in sections. Mercy, Isaiah 40, verses 1 to 5. Here we find comfort, the coming of the Lord to deliver. Beginning at verse 1. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says our God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her, that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a pathway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And then power in verses 3 to 8. Here we find glory, permanence versus human weakness. Beginning at verse 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice said, cry out. And he said, why shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands for ever. And then we go back to mercy in verses 9 to 11. There's good news of deliverance, the shepherd of his people. Beginning at verse 9, O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem. You who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those who are with young. And then back to power in verses 12 to 26. The incomparable creator, beginning at verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in balance? Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or as his counsellor has taught him? With whom did he take counsel, and who instructed him, and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are a drop in a bucket, and are counted as the small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the isles as a very little thing. 
and Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its beasts sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before them are as nothing, and they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare to him? The workman moulds an image, the goldsmith overspreads it with gold, and the silversmith casts silver chains. Whoever is too impoverished for such a contribution chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks for himself a skilled workman to prepare a carved image that will not totter. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless." Scarcely shall they be planted, scarcely shall they be sown, scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth, when he will also blow on them, and they will wither, and the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me, or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and see who has created these things. Who brings out their host by number? He calls them all by name. By the greatness of his might, and the strength of his power, not one is missing. And then finally, mercy, in verses 27 to 31. As creator, gives power to the faint, beginning at verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God? Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Having introduced God's might in terms of his glory and permanence in verses 3 to 8, Isaiah elaborates on his power and superior wisdom, which makes earth and earthlings appear puny, as we read in verses 12 to 17. Here, Isaiah's style, with rhetorical questions and vivid analogies referring to the earth and its parts, sounds like God's answer to Job in Job chapter 38 to 41. Question, what is the answer to Isaiah's rhetorical question? To whom then will you liken God? And for that we go back to verse 18, which reads, To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare to him? For Isaiah, as for Job, the answer goes without saying, No one. God is incomparable. But Isaiah picks up on his question and refers to the answer that many ancient people implied by their actions, which is that God is like an idol, in verses 19 and 20, the workman moulds an image, the goldsmith overspreads it with gold, and the silversmith casts silver chains. Whoever is too impoverished for such a contribution chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks for himself a skilled workman to prepare a carved image that will not totter. To this notion, Isaiah responds, Already it looks foolish to use an idol as a likeness of God. But just to be sure people get the point, he elaborates on God's uniqueness and brings in the unanswerable argument that he is the Holy Creator, beginning at verse 21. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understand from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits upon the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, 
and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted. Scarcely shall they be sown. Scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth, when he who will also blow on them, and they will wither, and the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one is missing. Question. How does verse 27 reveal the attitude of the people addressed by Isaiah's message? In what ways are we guilty of having the same attitude? Isaiah 40, verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, O speak, O Israel, My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God? The purpose of God's message is to comfort people who need it. Like Job, their suffering had made them confused and discouraged concerning his character. And so to finish the day. The verses for today show not only God's mercy and his power, but also the fact that he is the creator. Why is this truth so important to understand? How does the Sabbath each week help reinforce this crucial point? Thursday, February 18, The Problem with Idolatry Idolatry destroys a unique, intimate relationship with God by replacing Him with something else. We read about this in Exodus 20, verses 4 and 5. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. And Isaiah 42, verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory, and I will give to another, not my praise, to carved images. So, prophets refer to idolatry as spiritual adultery, as in Jeremiah 3, verses 6 to 9. The Lord said also to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree, and there played the harlot. And I said, After she had done all these things, return to me. But she did not return. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Then I saw that all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. So it came to pass, through her casual harlotry, that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. And Exodus 16, verses 15 to 19. But you trusted in your own beauty, played the harlot because of your fame, and poured out your harlotry on every one passing by who would have it. You took some of your garments and adorned multicoloured high places for yourself, and played the harlot on them. Such things should not happen nor be. You have also taken your beautiful jewellery from my gold and my silver, which I had given you, and made for yourself male images and played the harlot with them. You took your embroidered garments and covered them, and you set my oil and my incense before them. Also, my food which I gave you, the pastry of fine flour, oil and honey, which I fed you, you set it before them as sweet incense, and so it was, says the Lord God." Question. Read Isaiah 41, verse 29. How does Isaiah characterize idols? How do you understand what he is saying there about them? 
why is this so accurate a depiction of any idol, no matter what it is? Isaiah 41, 29. Indeed, they are all worthless. Their works are nothing. Their moulded images are wind and confusion. Ancient idolaters believed they worshipped powerful divine beings through images or symbols of them. Worship of an idol representing another god breaks the first commandment, Exodus 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. But if an idol is intended to represent the true god, as the golden calf was in Exodus 32, 4 and 5, the Lord rejects it as a likeness of himself, for nobody knows how to depict him, as we'll also read in Deuteronomy 4, 15 to 19. But first... Exodus 32, beginning at verse 4. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool, and made a moulded calf. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation, and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And Deuteronomy 4, beginning at verse 15. Take careful heed to yourselves, for you saw no form when the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest you act corruptly and make for yourselves a carved image in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, or the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, or the likeness of any fish that is in the water beneath the earth. And take heed, lest you lift your eyes to heaven. And when you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the host of them, you feel driven to worship them, and serve them, which the Lord your God has given to all the peoples under the whole heaven as a heritage." and nothing can represent his incomparable glory and greatness. Thus, an idol itself functions as another god, and worshipping it breaks the first and second commandments. God's people don't need idols, because they have his real Shekinah presence with them in his sanctuary. To worship an idol is to replace and therefore deny his real presence. Question? What kind of idolatry do we face as a church today? Does idolatry appear in more subtle forms in the church today? If so, how? From the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 2, pages 1011 and 12, Ellen White writes, Many who bear the name of Christians are serving other gods besides the Lord. Our Creator demands our supreme devotion, our first allegiance. Anything which tends to abate our love for God or to interfere with the service due to Him becomes, therefore, an idol. End of quote. We know from ancient writings that idolatry was attractive because it was about materialism. Using modes of worship people could relate to, idolaters honoured forces they believed could give them fertility and prosperity. It was self-help religion. Sound familiar? Just before the Lord comes again, with his way prepared by the roadwork of a final Elijah message of reconciliation described in Malachi 4, the choice will be the same as in the days of Isaiah. Will you worship the Creator, or will you worship something else? And we read about that in Revelation chapter 13 and chapter 14. For in the end, we always worship something. Friday, February 19. From the book Praetiarchs and Prophets, page 311, we read, In Isaiah's day, the spiritual understanding of mankind was dark through misapprehension of God. Long had Satan sought to lead men to look upon their Creator as the author of sin and suffering and death. 
Those whom he had thus deceived imagined that God was hard and exacting. They regarded him as watching to denounce and condemn, unwilling to receive the sinner so long as there was a legal excuse for not helping him. The law of love by which heaven is ruled had been misrepresented by the arch-deceiver as a restriction upon men's happiness, a burdensome yoke from which they should be glad to escape. He declared that its precepts could not be obeyed and that the penalties of transgression were bestowed arbitrarily. And that brings us to our three discussion questions this week. 1. Summarise in your own words the message of Isaiah 40 verses 12 to 31. Write it using modern images such as modern scientific discoveries that show even more graphically the awesome power of our God. Share your summary with the class. And to make it easier, I'll actually read from a very modern translation, the God's Word translation. We're beginning in Isaiah 40 and verse 12. Who has measured the water of the sea with the palm of his hand, or measured the sky with the length of his hand? Who has held the dust of the earth in a bushel basket, or weighed the mountains on a scale and the hills on a balance? Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or instructed him as his adviser? Whom did he consult? Who gave him understanding? Who taught him the right way? Who taught him knowledge? Who informed him about the way to understanding? The nations are like a drop in a bucket, and are considered to be like dust on a scale. The weight of the islands is like fine dust. All the trees in Lebanon are not enough to burn an offering. Its wild animals are not enough for a single burnt offering. All the nations amount to nothing in his presence. He considers them less than nothing and worthless. To whom, then, can you compare God? To what statue can you compare him? Craftsmen make idols, goldsmiths cover them with gold, silversmiths make silver chains for them. The poorest people choose wood that will not rot and search out skilful craftsmen to set up idols that will not fall over. Don't you know? Haven't you heard? Haven't you been told from the beginning? Don't you understand the foundations of the earth? God is enthroned above the earth, and those who live on it are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the sky like a canopy, and spreads it out like a tent to live in. He makes rulers unimportant, and makes earthly judges worth nothing. They have hardly been planted, they have hardly been sown, they have hardly taken root in the ground. Then he blows on them, and they wither, and a windstorm sweeps them away like straw. To whom, then, can you compare me? Who is my equal? asks the Holy One. Look at the sky and see who created these things. Who brings out the stars one by one? He calls them all by name. Because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. Jacob, why do you complain? Israel, why do you say, My way is hidden from the Lord and my rights are ignored by my God? Don't you know? Haven't you heard? The eternal God, the Lord... The creator of the ends of the earth doesn't grow tired or become weary. His understanding is beyond reach. He gives strength to those who grow tired and increases the strength of those who are weak. Even young people grow tired and become weary and young men will stumble and fall. Yet the strength of those who wait with hope in the Lord will be renewed. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and won't become weary. They will walk and won't get tired. Question 2. How does Isaiah's description of the permanence of God's word versus the fragile transience of human life, as in Isaiah 40, 6-8, speak to your fear of death? Let's read that, Isaiah 40, beginning at verse 6. The voice said, Cry out, and he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. 
How does it relate to your hope of resurrection? Well, let's look at some texts that are suggested here. Job 19, verses 25 to 27. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. And Daniel 12, verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And First Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 57. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 19. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. And our final question. By taking Isaiah 40 verses 12 to 31 to heart, how could one be cured of pride and arrogance? And so to summarise this week's lesson. Through Isaiah, God brought comfort to those who had been suffering. Their time of trouble had ended and God was returning to them. Rather than being discouraged and confused, they could trust God to use his creative power on their behalf. Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Seven Little Fishes of Men, and it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. What is the power of a small group? The pastor of a Seventh day Adventist church in northeastern Mexico announced to its 60 members that they should form small groups to meet during the week. Each group should have a name, a motto, a goal, and a theme song. The idea came from the local conference. Several adults immediately formed a small group called Joseph, saying, let's be like Joseph and have a vision to save others. Other adults established groups called Sowers of Faith, The Rock, Friends of Jesus and United in Faith. The director of the Children's Ministries Department also wanted to create a group. She gathered the seven children and their parents who regularly worshipped at Nuevo Tampico Seventh-day Adventist Church in Altamira to discuss the idea, and the mother of eight-year-old Manuel offered her house for the weekly meetings. The group adopted the name Fishers of Men. Fifteen children showed up for the first meeting, including eight children from non-Adventist homes who were invited by the Children's Ministries Director Elsa Galvan. The children took turns reading a Bible story. They also sang songs and prayed. 
At the end of the hour-long gathering, the children drank hot chocolate and ate cookies. The Fishers of Men group began to meet every week. The children also visited a hospital once a month to pray with patients and to distribute the Adventist Church's sharing book of the year. The children gave atoli hot drinks to the patients and tortoise bread filled with beans and cheese. With a stable group of children attending week after week, the small group decided to form an adventurer club. Later, the older children in the group created a Pathfinder club. After a while, the children started offering Bible studies to family members, friends and neighbours. With the help of his mother, Manuel gave Bible studies to his grandfather and aunt. One day, his grandfather and aunt announced that they wanted to go to the hospital with the children. Shortly afterward, they were baptised. Manuel and his mother are now giving Bible studies to an eight-year-old cousin. Many other children also are giving Bible studies, including 12-year-old Victor and his mother, who are studying with an eight-year-old friend and two cousins aged seven and nine. In its first year, Fishers of Men led 12 people to baptism, more than half of the 20 people baptised in the church over that period. This says a lot about the power of a small group, said the church's 34-year-old pastor, Samuel Alvarado, pictured with Manuel, Left and Victor. Jesus started his ministry with a small group of 12 disciples, and our church is doing the same for the glory of God. What an amazing story. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.